Yep. Hi, I'm Alan Milaisis from the Pilates Institute of Australia and I'm going to show you a brief little demonstration on why neutral spine actually does not work effectively and how it can actually strain your back. So I've got Alicia who's going to help me on this demonstration. Alicia, would you like to come around? Um, first of all, we're going to start with lying on the back on the trap table. And just to get into a normal position, we'll take a question where to start. Getting into a normal position, lying on the back with knees bent. And as you can see from this position, if Alicia takes her arm out of the way, and I lift the t-shirt up a little bit, you can see there's that neutral spine there. So there's a bit of a curve in the back, and if you got down a little bit lower, you could probably see daylight under there. Now, this is one of my biggest gripes in Pilates, because Pilates never used neutral spine, never really mentioned it in any of his works. However, physiotherapists have brought Pilates, the neutral spine into Pilates probably about 10 years ago, and everybody's using it. But before we get into that, let's talk about breathing techniques just here while lying down. If you keep your hands by your sides, most people, when they actually lie on the floor, um, doing any sort of floor work and things like that, they'll usually have palms down. Now, when you have palms down, and I know a lot of instructors can say, well, we can internally rotate the ulnar and radius, so there's no problem there, it doesn't affect the shoulder. But your average person, when they turn palms down, you're going to see a lift of the shoulder and a rotation, internal rotation of the humerus. If you turn the palm up, you can see how the shoulder drops back a bit. The other most important point about this is, if people have their palms down, and we'll see this when we get to the 100, if people have their palm down, that internal rotation will actually tighten their pecs. And as you can see here, that pec is going to be tightened because the shoulder is lifted. With the palm up, the shoulder opens, the pec releases. So you're going to actually get more breathing capacity. Coming back to breathing capacity, if, Alicia, if you just take a couple of normal, comfortable breaths in and out, as if you were asleep, and just normal breaths in and out. And as you can see, with the normal breaths in and out, you can see how the chest rises and falls. Just notice how much it's rising and falling. The other thing is, if we move the arm out of the way again, and if you take a huge, huge breath in, and you'll see how this tends to arch up a lot. I mean, we're exaggerating a little bit here, but it does it tend to arch up a bit. Relax down. Okay, let's lift your head up. Rest the head. Okay. Now, this may not look comfortable. Um, you can use different height cushions if you need to. This is standard cushion height that we use. And again, just breathing normally. And you'll notice when breathing normally in this position as opposed to the position without the cushion, the lung capacity is actually bigger. Now, if you take a big breath in again, you'll notice that there's no, not so much of an arch in the back, there's more stability in your thoracic spine when you're taking the deep breath in. So my question here also is, why not have a cushion or a support under the head when doing floor work, but why is there a headrest on the reformer? If Pilates didn't want you to have your head raised, then there wouldn't be a headrest on the reformer. The other thing is, if your head were raised on the reformer and your feet were higher, as in on the foot bar, that would mean that your back would be flatter. But here, your feet are down on the floor, which means that if your pelvis, if you had tight quads, your pelvis may anteriorly rotate, so therefore there's more chance of an arch in your back. So therefore, why not have a cushion underneath the head? Okay? It opens up the lung capacity, it stabilizes the thoracic spine. Now, let's just get back into doing a contraction here. So we're going to just come up into a small little stomach crunch and hold it just there. Now, it came up a little bit too high there. So you've got to watch, when you're coming up into a contraction forward, you've got to keep the ribs in the same level as the hips. The minute they move up higher than the level of the hips, you're going to engage your psoas. So in this position here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep Alicia's hands in the position we have, which is palms facing inwards, and with the hands at mid-thigh level. So in this position here, I'm going to check with three things here with Alicia. The contraction of the abdominals, how well and how deeply they're pulling in how much elevation you're getting off the ground without the ribs lifting higher than the level of the hips, and also how much neck strain there is. And in this position, when you come back from a neutral spine to this position, you're flattening the back, because there's no arch in the back anymore, that's flat, but there's going to be a lot of neck strain. So, just roll back down again, and when you go back down, you're going to find that you'll get back to your neutral spine with the arch in the back. Now, what we don't like, basically, is the strain on the neck. And if you do ask most of your clients, the strain in the neck is actually going to be on the back of the neck not on the front of the neck, which is the muscles that work against gravity. So what we're going to do here is the thing where we're going to lengthen out the spine, we call it the offering. So if you roll the back side up, lengthen out your spine, so roll up a little bit more so you can just work this a bit more. Lengthen it out and stretch it out. So basically, you're offering your butt to your heels. 
Now, in that case, we lengthened out the lower back here, so there's no arch in the back, there's no neutral spine. So now, if we draw a line from your belly button to your spine, that'll hit about your L2, L3 vertebra in your back. If we place a coin underneath that, we'll call that the lumbar coin. Underneath the sacrum, which is not tucked, it's not tilted, all we've done is lengthen it out. There's another coin called the sacral coin underneath the sacrum. When both coins are down, we call that stable spine. So what we're going to do now is come up into another contraction. Good. And a bit closer, bring the ribs to the hips. There, that's it. So we're keeping the ribs at the same level of this here as the hips. And you'll notice here, I'm not sure if you noticed this from the first DVD, from the first part of the DVD, that the abs are a bit flatter, but you'll notice that the elevation is probably better with the ribs in a horizontal plane, but also is there less neck strain. Yeah. And this is the most important thing is whether you've got neck strain or not. And relax back down again. So it does take away an enormous amount of neck strain by just doing the softening because if you look at this, let's go back to neutral spine, moving the arms out of the head, so get into the arch there. So move the arms so we can see the arch of the back. Yep. And just tuck that in, just to make it easier. Okay. So we've got a little bit of an arch in the back there. As you can see, I can place my hand underneath there. Now, that means that the rib cage here is in contact with the floor, trap table, and the hips are in contact with the trap table. So when you're contracting forward or when you're curling forward, that arch is going to disappear. So what's going to happen is the lower part of the back here is going to flatten. But if you think about it this way, if we think of, say, putting the Sydney Harbour Bridge into a side view into this position here, you're going to have the arch of the bridge. One pylon will be the rib cage, the other pylon will be the hips. Now those two pylons don't move. But when you contract forward, so we come up into contraction, you'll notice that when you're contracting forward, that space there squashes down. Okay? When you go back again, that space reappears. So what we're going to, what you're actually doing here is you're compacting the lower back. Now I know there are some schools of thought that call this imprinting. It actually is not imprinting. In order to imprint your spine, you have to have one end up in the air, one end in contact, and then each vertebrae lengthens away as you imprint down. If both ends are in contact here, and you're squashing it down to flatten the back, you're actually compacting the back. You're contracting your back muscles. So you, when these muscles are contracted here, they're being pulled tight. So when there's tightness happening here, curling up the head part is going to be an actual strain because the muscles that are here, the, all those really long muscles that go from the base of your spine to the base of your skull, are being squashed here. So therefore, that's why the back of the neck does the straining when you're curling forward because it's, being, it's trying to pull you back. You cannot co-contract two opposing muscles. You can't contract the back and contract the abs. It's just like you can't contract your bicep and your tricep at the same time. If you're contracting one, the other must lengthen. In order to, for the back to lengthen so the neck doesn't strain, so you can get a better contraction, more elevation, more connection of the abdominals, you have to lengthen out the spine. You cannot do this from a neutral position. It's the same thing if you're doing the hundreds. You'll find that if you go from a neutral position, and we'll keep Alicia's head down, if you go from a neutral position, bend your knees up, up towards you, and now extend your legs up into the air. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to take the legs vertically, and you're going to again watch the back here. You're going to take your legs as low as you can before your back starts to arch. Okay? We're keeping the head down for these purposes. And you're going to notice that there's going to be a struggle going on here. So don't let your back arch at all. Not at all. Okay. okay so that's the angle there. This is, I mean, we've just got that tucked in there. But you can feel this is actually raised up a little bit here. Okay. So now, bend your knees. Feet on the ground. Roll your back side up. Do the offering. So lengthen it right out. Take the legs, knees up back towards you again. Legs up into the air again. And also, the, the important thing about this also is if people start with neutral spine and they're going to do, say, circles, both legs up in the air, you'll find that because their back is contracted, they won't be able to get their legs as vertical as if they've lengthened out the spine first, then take their legs up into the air. This is going to be a much more comfortable position. So, from this position here, again, lower the legs to where your back stays absolutely flat. And you can see how the legs go a lot lower as well because we don't have a pull of your psoas on your back as well because the psoas isn't contracted up as well. Because when you arch back relax, when, when you're contracting your back from a neutral position curling forward, your psoas is actually much more active. So therefore, what your abs are trying to do is trying to keep your back flat, try and keep your psoas down, and try and get some strength. Now, we've added on a new position here called Manese's position. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring the legs up, take the legs up to parallel, again, hands by your sides, and you're going to lower the legs as low as you comfortably can without the back arching. So keep the back absolutely flat. Okay, we've found just about there because you're going to start seeing some movement there. 
So in this position here, the psoas still wants to activate and try to pull up because your hip flexors are engaged. So what we're going to do is lengthen the psoas. So notice the angle of the legs. Bring the legs back up again. Dorsiflex the feet. And turn the legs in so your toes are coming in and your heels are open. This does cause on a lot of dancers, especially a little bit of a cramp of the, of the muscle on the outside, on the lateral side of the, the leg. That takes some getting used to. Don't open the legs, don't internally rotate the legs too much if that happens. Just start small and work your way. So, we've got quite a good internal rotation here. Blow the legs, keep them back, keeping that lumbar coin down as much as possible. And notice how much lower the legs can go because of that. Now, if in this position here, if you move the arms out of the way, so move right up so we can see the camera there. Now, in this position here, if I bring the heels back to parallel, you're going to see the back arching and there's going to be a strain on the back. Okay, so we don't want that to happen. So, in this position here, you can actually work your abs a lot stronger. We can do this from a flat position as well. So, if you have your knees together, open your feet really wide, toes apart, dorsiflex your feet, and the knees are together, and then contract forward, up to there, keeping your ribs down. That's it. And you'll find this is also a much, much more comfortable position. You don't feel like your back is being pulled up. So, you actually get flatter abs because your psoas is lengthened. It's not trying to bunch up. If you've got a very strong psoas and weak abs, it's going to do most of the work. Whereas this will actually make your abs do a lot more work and you'll feel the abs working harder. Okay? Now, when we do the hundreds, draw the knees back up to your chest. Okay? So, you're keeping the contraction position, extend the legs up into the air. Now, normal position here is feet pointed or they have flexed or flexed and turned out, the variations on that. If you keep the hands down by the sides here with the palms facing down, there is a little bit of an internal rotation that occurs here on most normal people. I know the mechanics of it, you can rotate like that without the humerus rotating. But most people, ordinary lay people, cannot do that. So, what we're going to do is, if you pump the hands up and down here, doing the hundreds, you're going to notice there's movement of the neck, there's movement elsewhere. When you're pumping up and down, you will actually feel that the... and you're reaching forward. The thing is, when you reach forward, your lats also connect. So if you're reaching forward, your lats will stabilize your spine and prevent you from coming into a better contraction. So that's why what we've done is, in order to get your breathing, so you can breathe into the armpits as well, with your hands close by your sides reaching forward, you cannot breathe laterally. You can't breathe posteriorly because your back is on the ground, you're contracted, you're contracting your chest. Very difficult to breathe up here as well. So we've taken the hands to take palms in, which means, as you can see, this externally rotated, opened up the pec. Bring the hands up to mid-thigh level, both hands. Bend the elbows slightly, so there's no reaching going on here, because your abs, this is an ab exercise. Because you've got the elbow bent, you can breathe into the armpits. Much, much, much easier. And from that position there, then you can do the hundredth. But what we do is breathe in to knee level, out to mid-thigh. In, and keeping the contraction. That's going to work your abs. Obviously, you take your legs as low as possible, parallel, or you can do the nasal position, flex feet, heels open, that's it, that's it. And you're going to find that that will work a lot harder. If you start to feel the neck straining, place your hands in what we call top position. So hands, thumbs in your occiput. So when you have your hands in this position here, you have your thumbs like that in your occiput, the base of your skull. Do not let the thumbs touch your neck at all. In this position here, you can then press your head into your hands 5% and you feel the abs working a lot harder. Reciprocal inhibition. You're going to actually press the head backwards so you're not straining it forward. You're not pulling on the neck. You're pressing back, keeping your shoulder blades off the ground, your abs will work a lot harder. Okay? Um, if there are any comments on this, please send them in. My email address is alan, A-L-L-A-N, at pilates.net. And you can find a lot more information on our website, pilates.net. And thanks to Alicia for all the work she's done. Thanks. And then we'll cut it. And this bloody phone.